the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I am Reverend Rebecca Luter. I am the pastor here at Farmington Presbyterian, and we are glad that you are worshiping with us. As we gather, if this is your first time visiting with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you will find Farmington Presbyterian to be a family of God that feels like home to you, and we look forward to meeting you in person. If you would like to be added to the communications of the church, if you would email us at churchoffice at farmingtonpres.org, we would be glad to let you know about the things going on in the life of our congregation. This morning, we continue our summer sermon series, Mind the Gap, Exodus, and the Space Between. Church, You have been faithful in continuing to give of your tithes and your offerings to the ministry and work of the church, making it possible for Farmington Presbyterian to continue to be a home for families with a heart for God's world. Thank you. To those of you who are going online to our website at farmingtonpres.org and giving there or mailing your offering to the church office. Come. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship and praise our God. Good morning, church. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. We gather to worship God, who is creator and liberator. God brought the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt and delivered them from the oppression of slavery. We gather to worship God, who is guide and guardian. 
God gave laws to establish boundaries for relationships with God and with one another. We gather to worship God, who is steadfast love. God commands us to love and worship only the Lord our God, and to do so with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor in the same way we love ourselves. God declares, maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. Yet our sins weigh us down and we struggle to live in freedom and joy. Confident in God's promise of deliverance, let us confess our sins before God and one another. With sorrowful hearts, we come before you, O God, to confess what you already know. We have failed to keep your laws. We have pursued our dreams and desires and chosen our selfish will over your will and your way, shown to us in Jesus. Forgive us, redeeming God. Send down your fire to refine our hearts. Cleanse us and our society from our faults. Forgive us for ignoring your voice and the voices of those in need. Forgive our apathy, our lethargy, our indifference to those who cry out. Cleanse the meditations of all our hearts that are unacceptable in your sight. Refine us by the flame of your spirit that we will be restored to live in its light. Proof of God's amazing love is this. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love for us. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. God's forgiven and reconciled children, let us together declare what it is we believe using our affirmation of faith. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise God, who created and is creating everything, the universe, the world, the plants and animals, and us, each of us, unique, individual, and beloved of God. We proclaim Jesus Christ, 
the crucified and risen one, full of grace and truth, who turns the other cheek, goes the second mile, brings healing with his touch, and teaches us both with words and example to live for God's glory. In the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we are drawn together as the body of Christ in the world, the beginning of a new creation. We acknowledge that we live and work between the time of Christ's death and resurrection and the time to come when God's kingdom is fully realized. In this time, we are a pilgrim people, always on the way towards the promised goal. On the way, Christ feeds us with word and sacrament, and we have the gift of the Spirit in order that we may not lose the way. We will live and work within the faith and unity of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, bearing witness to that unity which is both Christ's gift and his will. Together with all the people of God, we will serve the world for which Christ died and await God's kingdom with expectant hope. How do you feel about rules? No jumping on the bed. Don't throw toys at your brother. We have rules in all the different areas of our lives. We have rules in our classrooms. We have rules in our community. We even have rules in our homes. Stop making a ruckus! And I bet if you thought about it for a second, you could think of some of the things that are rules in your house. Time's up, you guys. Time's up. Time to turn it off. Turn it off! In the passage we're reading today for scripture, we arrive at a point where Moses is given some rules by God for God's community of people. What in the world? Y'all, who used the toilet last? <laughs> a lot of times we think that rules aren't fun and that sometimes rules are annoying. No, Hadley. No, Hudson. No, Hadley. No, for goodness sake. But these rules that God gave Moses to give to his people were important. Most of all, the rules or the Ten Commandments allowed us to understand the best way to love God is to love his people. All of the Ten Commandments come down to putting others, including God, before ourselves. That's a wonderful message to think about. When we have to think about a rule that we don't particularly like, sometimes it's in place to take care of other people. So let us take a time to say a prayer and thank God for rules. Dear God, thank you for rules. Thank you for giving us ways to love you. Thank you for giving us ways to love your people. Please allow us to love others well. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, may we hear your word and be transformed. May it be like fire raining down upon a burning bush that is aflame but not consumed. May it be like manna raining down in the wilderness to sustain. May it be like a pillar of cloud going ahead to guide. We pray in the name of the Word made flesh, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes to us from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. I'll be reading this morning from the New Revised Standard Version. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions 
And if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading this morning comes to us from Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. Listen now for the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Each year as we celebrate our nation's independence, I marvel at the hopes of our founders. Words like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ring with a vision of a community that didn't exist then, and doesn't exist now. At the same time that they penned those words, they penned a constitution to guide their life together. It began, the style of this confederacy shall be the United States of America. 
Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. The said states hereby severally enter into a firm league of friendship with each other for their common defense, the security of their liberties, and their mutual and general welfare, bringing themselves to assist each other against all force offered to or attacks made upon them or any of them on account of religion, sovereignty, trade, or any other pretense whatever. It is now known as the Articles of Confederation. It didn't last long as the Constitution. Ten years later, these much more familiar words were penned. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Life in community requires boundaries. Once the Israelites were no longer slaves in Egypt, they needed boundaries to form their relationships. The most important relationship was with God. So the first four boundaries they are given define their relationship with God, and the other six boundaries flow out of that foundational relationship to define their relationships with each other. Sibley Towner, one of my Old Testament professors in seminary, described the Ten Commandments as ten posts supporting the fence separating the viable community of Israel from the marauding beasts of disorder, confusion, and bloodshed howling outside the pale. Like the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and in order to, perform, to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, the commandments had a certain ring about them. They were written in a style to be recited and remembered. They are to shape and form who we are as God's covenant people. And at the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther argued that they should be read every worship service in preparation for the confession of sins. And John Calvin agreed that they should be a part of regular worship, but he believed that they should be read after the Declaration of Pardon as liberating directives for life freed from sin, as guides for our new life in Christ. Well, before they're read before we confess our sins or after we are pardoned for them, we need the reminder that we have fallen short and that we have a path forward. Presbyterian pastor James Chatham writes that the Ten Commandments are not about actions and consequences. There is no punishment specified for breaking a commandment. They are ethical cornerstones, eternal laws. For the community to follow them would lead to life. For the community to transgress them, would lead to sure and certain death. These are the guidelines for living abundantly in community. And to break them, whether by breaking the letter of the law or the spirit of the law, is to break relationship with God and with one another. Jesus made clear about the last five commandments, the ones about our relationship in community, that our attitudes and our thoughts are just as relationship-breaking as our actions. Thou shalt not murder or even have contempt for another person. Thou shalt not commit adultery or have lustful thoughts or feelings for another person. Thou shalt not steal either taking what belongs to another person or withholding what is rightfully theirs. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Society and relationships are based on truth and integrity. Thou shalt not covet. 
And I love the way Reverend Eugenia Gamble talked about this law in the Presbyterian women's study this spring. Covetousness, she wrote, is rooted not in the sense that we lack something we need, but in the sense that we ourselves are somehow lacking and that something outside of ourselves can fill that hole and address that fear. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not believe that you are not enough because you are made in the image of God. Which takes us back to the first four commandments. The Lord your God brought you out of Egypt. It is God who saves us. It is God who redeems us. It is God who sustains us. When we draw a breath, it is a gift of God. Why would we put anyone or anything before God in our lives? Why would we claim anything as ultimate? Let anything else shape who we are. And yet, we do. In 1997, Gerald Jansen published a book on Exodus, and in it, he said some words that I think are prophetic for today. He wrote this, The gods are alive and well, and they are many. Some are ideological. Some are political. Some are economic. Some are statistical. Some are strictly personal. I did it my way. And many are increasingly tribal. Our group versus them. As we stand in this liminal time, at the threshold between one period of history and the next, as our society seems to be shifting and questioning and tearing, it is time for us to examine our ultimate loyalty. It is time for us to ensure that we are not bowing down to worship any idol. It is time for us to call on God, not for our own advantage. The prophet Jeremiah warned of speaking, the, uh, speaking God's name in vain when our concern is greed rather than the least of these. He said, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No. They have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. And then the final two commandments pertain to our families. We are to follow a pattern of Sabbath, resting as God rested and working as God worked, and we are to honor our father and our mother. The command to honor father and mother was not given to control insolent children, but to assure the care of the elderly. Once a person's parents were no longer able to be productive in God's covenant community, they were not put out, but cared for by their children right relationship within our family, within our community, with our God. In ten rules, Jesus summarized them in two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you have everything else but you don't have love, you have nothing. And still, we haven't always gotten it right. As a nation, as a community, as neighbors, as a church, as a family. Dr. John Gottman is a psychologist who has researched marriage for the last 40 years. His website has, a terrific, mar has terrific marriage resources. One of his findings is that there are four communication styles that predict the end of a marriage. He calls them the four horsemen of relationships. Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. I would argue that we see these four horsemen at the end of any relationship 
and that when we engage in these styles of communication, we are no longer acting with love and therefore are not acting according to God's will. Criticism. You never and I always. Leads to defensiveness. You're the one who should. I don't know why I'm even involved. And over time, criticism and defensiveness leads to contempt. Could you be any more pathetic? Which leads to stonewalling, shutting down, withdrawing emotionally from relationship. It is true of all of our relationships. Marriages, parents and children, within families, communities, people groups, and within our nation. I read these interactions on Facebook and Twitter. I see them on the news and in politics as people talk about protests and police, masks, and the economy. My friends, mind the gap. In a 2006 commentary, Reverend Cecil Sherman wrote that the Ten Commandments are an essential piece of any conversation about how to make a divided, troubled, directionless people come together and live with some order and sanity and fairness. As we remember and give thanks for our nation, May we consider what a more perfect union could be in which justice is established, ensuring domestic tranquility. As we continue to social distance and minimize physical interactions, may we consider our relationships with those we interact with virtually and those with whom we share our homes. Life in community requires boundaries. May our boundary be love. Amen. It is the tradition of the Farmington family to share our prayer concerns as we worship, and so I encourage you to share your prayer concerns on YouTube in the chat so that we all may be in prayer together for the things that are on our hearts and our minds. Let us turn to God now in prayer. O Lord, you saw your people Israel in bondage and despair and brought them to freedom. Yet as they left the structure of Egypt, they struggled with community, longing to establish a people of faithfulness who lived according to your will. You gave simple truths to guide their lives and ours. We are to put you, O God, first in our lives. May every decision be weighed against your will, that our society and we might live lives of righteousness, doing justice, and showing mercy. We pray for our nation as we celebrate the gift of independence and ask you to hem us in as we swirl into chaos. Make our dreams for unity with liberty and justice for all a reality that you might be glorified. We give thanks for all who have sacrificed for the freedoms we enjoy. Keep us cognizant of the responsibilities that accompany our blessings. Give us vision and conviction to address the injustices and divisions and all in our society that holds us back from living into the blessed community for which you died. We lift to you this morning all who suffer. May they know your compassion and that you suffer along with them. We pray for those whose lives have been affected by pandemic those whose lives have been disrupted by broken promises, those whose lives have been upended by disease, those whose lives have no peace. 
We pray especially for those we name silently in our hearts before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear and answer our prayers. Give us faith. Give us hope. Most of all, give us love like Jesus that overflows in all our actions and attitudes. For we pray in his name and as he taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord our God guides, provides, and protects us. In response, we give our tithes and offerings in joyful gratitude. With rejoicing, let us offer our resources and our lives to God's work in the world through the church. Please join me in our prayer of dedication. Holy God, we rejoice in the gift of your Holy Spirit that ignites the desire in our hearts to seek you, that draws us together to live as your hands and feet in the world, that fills us with compassion, grace, and love. We dedicate ourselves and our offerings to your purposes in the world through Farmington's mission, 
by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. May your heart beat with love for God and neighbor. May your hands move with the grace of Christ. And may your feet be guided by the movement of the Holy Spirit to be God's faithful covenant community in the world. Amen.